In episode 1, we saw how the opening scenes of Bioshock contained a few esoteric symbols, such as the Illuminati Eye of Providence, the red rose on the parcel, and references to the Sun God. From this, I wove together Jungian concepts along with Joseph Campbell's hero theory and a small dose of Jordan Peterson. This was in order to propound my own personal viewpoint, which is that Bioshock is more than the sum of its parts, and can be seen as a spiritual, as well as a literal, journey. That is to say, that below the surface we see spiritual, mystical and esoteric symbols. These point to the hero's narrative, and how the hero treads a predictable mystical journey, starting as the fool, and ending as an enlightened person. Luke Skywalker in Star Wars epitomises this journey as he, like Jack, is nudged from a mundane and ordered reality into a new reality whereby his actions change the fate of the universe. He in part does this by not only making a physical journey, but by journeying into his own unconscious, where he is to face the dark side of his inner world in which archetypes such as separation from the father are confronted and ultimately resolved. This story is not original, and this narrative, as I hope I have alluded to, permeates the Tarot, the Kabbalah, and numerous other mystery doctrines and mainstream religions. In simple terms, man starts a new journey as a naive fool, as demonstrated in the first Tarot card, and through this journey changes inside as he responds to injustices in the physical world. After reviewing part 1, I have decided that it might be prudent at this point to elucidate some of the esoteric messages in the symbol of the Fools and Magicians card. This I hope will help clarify some of the ambiguity in part 1 and also provide some justifications for some of my dictates. So without further ado, let's start with an analysis of the card of the Fool in order to understand the start of the journey and how it relates to the Magician. We can see that the card contains a fairly young man whose head is in the clouds and is on some kind of journey. Facing upwards, his gaze is completely oblivious to the cliff edge he is potentially going to plummet off. His stance so far states that he is clearly a naive person and oblivious to the dangers inherent in the outside world. He has the sun behind his back highlighting his lack of enlightenment, for he is walking away from the true light, so to speak, or is at best unaware of it. We note that he is being followed and it seems warned by a white dog that he is about to fall to his death. It is not clear in the card whether or not he does so, but it's interesting to note that the dog represents his intuition. This notion is universal in many mystery traditions, and the fool's life or death depends solely on whether he pays heed to his spirit guide. The dog we note is white, which typically represents an innocence and purity. The fool, whilst being a fool, is not pictured here as a particularly bad person, just naive and clearly inexperienced. It's no surprise, therefore, that he represents the beginning of a new spiritual exodus. The fool we also note carries a small but inadequate bag for a long journey, so again this highlights inexperience on his part. Last, he carries a white rose in his left hand. Again, this is a symbol of purity and innocence, and this brings to mind the tradition of marriage, where the white rose is common, and again, it's not a stretch to think of the bride about to symbolically start on a new journey, as well as the fool. The card itself is numbered zero, and this is significant as it not only represents a soldier starting out, but the circular shape reminds us of the eternal wheel of life. The Fool has been with us before, and will be again. The Fool doesn't seem distressed, and seems happy to stroll along and deal with life foibles as they occur. Regarding his attire, we can see his garments adorned with yellow discs split into eight red segments. Again, as mentioned in the first part of this essay series, we have the same colours as signified in the alchemical tradition – red, yellow, white and black. Albedo, Negredo, Citronitas, and Rubedo. In fact, the fool does wear a red feather in his cap, and this typically signifies good health, courage, strength, and luck. All, by the way, found in later cards in the tarot deck. 
So in conclusion, although the fool is naive, he is a pure soul embarking on a journey which doubtlessly will be fraught with danger. On the plus side, he has all the qualities he needs to survive, but it's clear that the path will be long and arduous. Now I mentioned previously that I interpreted Jack in the plane as the fool in the opening of the game. This was because, like the fool, he seems oblivious to who he is, what he is about to do, and how his life is going to suddenly turn into a crazed chaos, literally in the next few moments. Like the fool, we know that from playing the game that his constitution will change and grow, and like the fool, he has a series of spiritual transformations up ahead of him, if he is to survive that is. In Jack we literally see physical changes in the forms of the plasmids which re-engineer his genetic makeup. Now, in the Magician's card which comes next, we have a quite different picture of the next stage. The Fool becomes the Magician, hopefully, and so now we see a more grounded and confident individual. His card is represented by the number one, and this tells us that he is now becoming initiated and is turning into literally some one. What I mean by this is he is not just a person bumbling along the road, but he is a practicing individual who knows his place. His place, as we can see, is behind the table, and on this table are four important symbols. The chalice, sword, a coin, and the magician's wand. These four objects represent the four suits in the tarot, and also the four elements of nature. The cup representing water, the coin earth, the sword representing air, and the wand is fire. An interesting additional here is that we note in the beginning of the game that Jack first starts in the plane, i.e. he's in the air. He lands in the water, the water is ablaze with fire, and the lighthouse he needs to reach is on land. Here again we have the four elementals from the tarot manifested in Jack's initial reality. The four elementals, however, are not tamed as is done by the magician, but in chaos and almost kill him, at least at the beginning of the game. So what this means then is that the magician, when fully manifested, has control over the elements of the physical world. We note here also that one hand is pointing to the heavens and the other to the ground, so two things become apparent. One, he has control over the whole world, as just mentioned, and second, we have the maxim, as above, so below, which is an aphorism associated with sacred geometry and hermeticism. Hermeticism comes from the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. For the record, Trismegistus means thrice blessed. There are a few interpretations of this aphorism, including in the Bible, but all equate with the idea that what affects the material realm also affects the spiritual, or what affects the microcosm affects the macrocosm. It seems strange to me now that patterns, rules and laws in nature, from the smallest atoms to the largest stars and cosmological phenomena, all obey the same fundamentals. Isaac Newton, although famous for his work in astronomy and physics, actually considered his work in alchemy as more significant than these studies, and I'm in no doubt that this maxim might have had some influence on his thinking. That is because, as above, so below, hints that there are universal laws at work. Anyway, I digress, so back to the magician. Above the magician's head, we have the famous Ouroboros, which is an ancient symbol often depicted by the serpent or dragon, and this represents infinity. This representation can vary in different traditions, but in summary, it can point to the cycles of the years, the descent and ascent to and from the underworld, and is even present in Carl Jung's work. I mentioned before the idea of individuation, which put simply means the integration of the personal conscious mind with the two halves of the unconscious mind, and in Jung, this symbol represents the assimilation of opposites, namely the shadow, with the conscious. To quote Jung in his own words, The Ouroboros is a dramatic symbol for the integration and assimilation of the opposite, i.e. of the shadow. 
This feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality, since it is said of the Ouroboros that he slays himself and brings himself to life, fertilizes himself and gives birth to himself. He symbolizes the one who proceeds from the clash of opposites, and he therefore constitutes the secret of the prima materia, which unquestionably stems from man's unconscious. So how does all this relate to our hero come magician? Our hero, who has now passed from the fall and the plane, will enter rapture and by overcoming all the elements and mastering rapture through the plasmids will turn the chaos found within into order. When he does this, not only will the world be back in harmony, but he himself will emerge an enlightened individual. That of course assumes that the player chooses to rescue the little girls and take the morally correct path. On this note I'll leave the essay here and continue in part 3. In the next part I promise we will explore the lighthouse and set foot in rapture. I apologise for this rather long preamble to the next part of the game, but I will at least now show you the most significant symbol that I found inside of the lighthouse, and that is this one. As you can clearly see, and on my first surprise, I couldn't believe what I was gazing at. This without doubt is one of the most glaring symbols of the modern West, the Masonic Square and Compass. The capital letter G is missing of course, but there are innumerable interpretations of this symbol, and not all of them have the letter G on them. What is significant are the set square and the compass themselves. I am however aware of time at this juncture, so we'll leave further discussion of this until next time, but dear listener, I can honestly say that from my initial discovery of the Eye of Providence on the lighthouse, to research into Apollo and the Rosy Cross, it was my discovery of this that led me to write and produce this whole video series. Thank you for watching.